How many of you make avalanches for a living? Anybody? Nobody makes an avalanche for a living. Do you have any controllers, highway people? Okay, well, this, is, this talk's going to be just boring. <laughs> uh, I started Chinook Pass. I started with the DOT in, in the spring of 1999. And any of you were around in the winter of 98, 99, particularly on the West Coast, it was a very good winter. We actually had, it was a record setting winter in Washington, Mount Baker, claimed the world's record for snowfall. And there are three sites in, in Washington State that generally run about the same for snowpack. That's Baker, uh, Paradise on Rainier, which held the previous world record. Uh, actually, four Top Belt and Tall and Chinook Pass. Very, very similar as far as amount of snow and, and snowfall. This winter, uh, Chinook's kind of leading the charge. I'm pretty stoked about that. So I started there in 99, and uh, at the summit of Chinook Pass on May 10th, we probed 13 feet down to reach the log bridge that's the Crest Trail crossing the highway. The top of that log bridge is 20 feet above the highway. So if you do the math there, how much snow there was in May, uh, it's pretty awesome. And uh, I loved it. I was hooked. I was like, man, this is like the best job in the world. You get to ski tour and blow things up and ski cut every day when you're outside. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, you know, everybody knows where Washington is, right? <laughs> <laughs> State. It's not for the cafeteria, yeah. Pacific Northwest. Uh, right where that star is, Chinook Pass is the east entrance of Mount Rainier National Park. Uh, and it actually is, is a state highway that goes through the park, so it's not part of the park system as far as, as like tolls and everything like that. But it is closed through the winter. The west Entrance, west side of, of Highway 410 is uh, where the Crystal Mountain cutoff is. And uh, you can see here, you see, try this little pointer, that's good. Is that Crystal Mountain and Chinook Pass, kind of pass. Uh, highway comes up from uh, Hayden Claw on the west side and cruises over towards Yakima in eastern Washington. Pretty nice stretch of highway. It was built in the 1930s uh, as, a, as a scenic highway, I think it was a CCC project. And they, uh, they picked a really cool line right across the highway where you can see everything. And uh, on this, probably through about, we've, we've estimated probably about 97 avalanche pads, mid-track. Um, there's a, there's a little nicer view. You can see the uh, finish there, avalanche activity, the summit. So just a perfect location for a highway. Uh, you could probably never keep it over in the winter. And, uh, and we had a, sometimes we struggled spring just during the clearing and we'll get into some of that. But, uh, typically a two month project in the spring will start on Monday and uh, with our goal of opening by Memorial Day weekend. And, and I think we're probably a little pressed to meet Memorial Day this year. Depends on how the spring goes. We get if it just stops snowing completely, yeah we'll get ahead. But uh, okay. usually snow about 60, 70 inches while we're down there at least in the first month or so. Um, our main job down there is to protect these guys. These guys have a sketchy job. They're out plowing, driving the bulldozers out on a steep slope in, in mid-track. And uh, so that's that's our primary focus is keeping them safe. Our secondary is to destroy the snowpack so there's no avalanche hazard when the highway does it open. And, uh, it's a little different approach. People are from ski areas where you know you're kind of going out there and try to make it safe but not like, destroy the place. Highway work, for those of you highway work, it's just about destroying the snow path. Um, do everything on skis, and so all ski touring, really, really fun, great terrain in there, and uh, you get to carry bombs every day. Unless, unless we get blessed by some nice weather, we can use a helicopter to fly. We have uh, three caches on the ridges for storing explosives, so one flight day we can take care of all this, or we're hauling. Using a hollow loads like this, that's uh, those are each one of those is equivalent to a quarter bag and a band post, so twelve and a half with a one pound driver. Um, what happens if they fall? Uh, you're kind of like a turtle on its back. This, this particular yeah, you don't fall. This particular spring, this this guy who was working with as a, as a temp employee, um, he was guiding up to Nolan later <laughs> that spring, and he was like, I need to get in shape, load me up. So he, he went for it. Yeah, nice, nice terrain, very, uh, very peaceful. And later on tonight, we'll talk about my 
other part of my job, which is interstate, very loud and busy and chaotic. This is this is important nice. Uh, okay, so we use a lot of info, we'll look things up. We'll see some videos of that and uh, hopefully that'll be uh, that'll be enjoyable. Uh, pretty interesting to, to dive into the snowpack there, you know, completely guys touch in their snowpack. And uh, unlike wintertime explosives control where we're usually you know hand charges are near or above the surface we're doing everything below the surface so we'll, we'll go out on the slope carry charges as deep as we can uh link a number of them together and really try to go back to place and uh, yeah we get some good results from time to time uh it's pretty interesting you know occasionally we'll like you can see here we have you know wet slack component up here as so you can see these nice wet Bands, and then much drier snow underneath, depending on the time of year. So you can get get this mixed action, really wet flowing, but then like little powder clouds will pop out of it. Powder clouds, <laughs> a little different in the Northwest, what we consider to be powder. My previous supervisor used to say, if you, if you, can, if you can't drink it, it's still powder. <laughs> Occasionally, yeah, we get into some some much bigger uh, wet action, like you see here. We've been hiking up and down that slope for a couple of weeks before that happened. And uh, that was from the corn straw. But then we can trigger it. Yeah, and as I said, a lot of ski cutting. <clears throat> Wet snow component is, is, you know, it's all south to southeast aspect there. So a lot of solar. And at least two of our three, we kind of separate into three knobs. Two of our three knobs are uh, our leeward slopes. So they, they load uh, both in the spring and also, also throughout the winter. It's a nicely structured snowpack. And a lot of solar activity. It's like peeling at night. A little different technique. You can get into really wet snow than, than a lot of people are used to in like skier operations, drier snow, particularly dealing with like dry dry snow, storm slabs, and suddenly you're in this wet snow. And sometimes you know you gotta commit yourself and, and push in there a little ways. Uh, Good results from this kind of typical ski cutting results. Uh, our maintenance crews don't are particularly stoked when we film the behind them. Uh, they don't really get to see it happen. They're, they're actually they like because you know who doesn't like seeing an avalanche? Uh, wet slabs, on the other hand, especially with the with an old persistent weak layer, um, they're not a, a regular part of the operation, but they do happen, and, and that's where we really back off is getting in. That, those kind of conditions and ski cutting are just, they don't mix. Uh, very, you know, it's a very dangerous situation. Uh, a little, way more unpredictable than, say, just a wet piece of snow. And uh, <clears throat> a little quick story here of a, like a near miss that I had. Uh, I was ski cutting this section through here. Probably one of the funnest ski cuts that I know of, that I've done. I've done a lot over the years. You can start right at, at this corner of this rock and pretty much just do this long descending side sloping traverse and peel everything off behind you on a good day, it is awesome. All that snow's going through these chutes and cliffs, and just pounding on the road. And just, you know, you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things you can run into over here is there's a slight change in aspect, and the wind can come through this gap. And a little bit of wind on the snow, especially on wet snow, what does it do? It evaporates, so it causes some suddenly the, the conditions can change and it can tighten up. On a particular day that I was doing a ski cut through there, was it actually wasn't doing a ski cut, it was really nice corn, snow. And I come down there and I'm like, oh, this is great, the skiing's awesome, not breaking through, and I'm going to ski the chute right here. Started on the chute, and I just, just get out of that wind a little bit, and, and my skis start to sink in, I checked up real quick, and that whole thing ripped out probably 20 inches deep, big wet slab. And it wasn't even like a slab that, that pulled away. Like as soon as it broke, it just disintegrated. And this big flow of like concrete. And, uh, that, was, that was a little spooked. Pretty tricky condition. Um, <clears throat> had some other instances. Went loose from the ridges. It starts to build mass and momentum. Breaks down into a wet slab. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a little. You know, a little unnerving. Also, it's pretty awesome because also you have a really, really big avalanche. 
right below you. <clears throat> this one in particular was especially impressive because of the sound it made when you hit the guardrail and broke all those posts. Uh, <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> These guys, not so much. <laughs> they were pretty fun. The previous day they'd been working in about 80 degree weather t shirts, okay. and then they get set up here to do that. Really? Thanks. Yeah, we broke broke some other parts of the road, uh, reinforced retaining wall, and uh, <clears throat> even though you know it was one avalanche, obviously that, that broke that. It was a, a series of slides over the years that just happened in that spot, both from us and then and through the winter. When there's, when there's shower snow on the road, unfortunately that road can melt out and the starting zones can, can load at the same time and uh, it's pretty big action there. We rely on, on a lot of the indicators around cornice, you know, natural cornice fall for you know, helping us assess the, the uh, instability in the area. <clears throat> what are those cornices are doing when they fall? You know, that was a, that was a natural that happened. That was kind of, we hadn't seen any deeper slabs at that point. And uh, that happened that day, and within the next week, a few of our explosives um, triggered deeper slabs like that. So it's, that was pretty big surprise. Obviously, glide avalanche is a good indicator that, that water is getting down deeper into the snowpack, starting to lubricate the uh, down to the ground. Uh, you know, on a broader scheme, rivers and rivers rising and falling can help indicate a return to stability that water is flushing through the snowpack. In this case, we have these two rivers that come together right here. You can see this one's running rather brown, so lower elevation, and that drains a lower elevation area. That area has really flushed the water through, snowpacks draining, and uh, within the next week, temperatures cooled, the river dropped, and it spread back to stability. Pretty much a, what we call a summer snowpack, isothermal, well drained, and just a good scheme from that point on. As I said, it's a lot of like getting in the snow. We have weather instrumentation there, but this is like we're in a remote area, very limited cell service, computers. We, you're really stepping away from those computer models and weather station data. That thing doesn't always work. Um, it's really getting the snow and you know, the snow structure. That's it's a big part of it. And just the feel of your skin, or your skin. Yeah, as I said, lots of, lots of snow will fall through the spring. And uh, it's pretty interesting. We can get 60 to 70, on average, 60 to 70 inches of snowfall through April and into early May and see very little accumulation overall. So I, um, we're just doing is just adding more and more water to that snowpack, and, uh, and that's just all material for, for future avalanches. <clears throat> so uh, two quick little accidents that have happened there, and, and a couple of different perspectives on these. This one we had a late April, early May storm, really, really windy, lots of lots of wind transport. <clears throat> Myself and another worker we actually tried to go up that ridge to lower some bombs into a into a pocket and uh, we both got flat 70 feet mile hour winds. Uh, we retreated briefly and then decided we were gonna let the wind beat us whatever still shot. That's just the way it is. Um, lots of loading. We left for the weekend, wind died off, temperatures went way up, you know, freezing level up to twelve thousand feet or so through the weekend. Return on Monday and most of the evidence of that new snow is gone. Like it, it melted into the snowpack, and uh, it really looked like like we were kind of done. Like we weren't going to really see any avalanche on that cycle. We get up to the top of this point right here. We call knob one, and, uh, and there's a little pocket there of some remaining new snow, but fairly shallow, three or four inches deep. I ski in just right to that rock point, triggered a a slab, uh, called our other team that was just on the other side of the rock, that, hey, we, we got a slab, and pulled up on what you're doing. <clears throat> My partner went in, and he started in this way, and started triggering a slab as he went across the slope. It was, it was pretty sensitive, you know, like, touch up the skis, and we go. Ski out another 20 feet, touch up the skis, and we go. And uh, real consistent. At one point, he's getting low, and you know, I said, hey, maybe you want to hike back up, set yourself come into it higher. <laughs> he felt he was at the other end of the slab. 
the surface structure changed, a lot of snowballs, and it just didn't have that, that kind of smooth, loaded look to it. And he got out, out on that area of snowballs, and it didn't react to the <laughs> um, Instead of continuing with that slab approach of like traversing across the slope, he now went into more of a wet, loose attitude and started side slipping. And he started, as soon as he started side slipping, the slab broke out around. Maybe five feet in front of the skis, five feet behind the skis, ten feet above, three, three inches. Three inches, not three feet. Three inches. <laughs> Very small slab, but, uh, but went dense and you know, took him right into some really steep terrain. That's more or less his track that he took. Looks up like that. Very fortunate that this, as the slide comes through here, it splits on this feature. And this part right here continued on through the trees, onto the highway, across the highway, and down to the mountain. That was where the bulk of the avalanche was. He managed to get himself over there. Another steep will shoot. Um, that happened, I moved down to that tree to watch him. I was calling him on the radio, telling him I see it, I see it. You know, seeing skis flying up in the air, <clears throat> all this equipment going this way and that. <clears throat> he finally came to a rest down here on the flats. Um, I called him on the radio, saying, you know, can you hear me? Are you all right? Didn't get a response. So raise your hand, he raised his hand. And uh, skied down, <clears throat> recovered all his gear, except for one ski. Ball cap, sunglasses. <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing. It is. It was a big ride. He was his pack during that. Hit the, one of the straps had come up over his head. And it was on his neck. On this side, his arms like trapped like that. Um, he was a little bruised, but uh, and I'm sure it looked smooth. But I think I was more smooth watching it. And, uh, <clears throat> so the, the take home from that was he came into it with one approach, which was slab and one method in the particular method of ski cutting. And he changed it mid mid slope without you know maybe following through. And, uh, and that change in approach caught if he had continued just traversing across, he probably would have triggered that last little pocket and skied out of it. And so it's pretty important like you recognize the conditions that you're faced with and assess the approach to that. Um, a couple years ago, we had a <coughs> different inc incident, and it was more of a forecasting problem. We weren't on the hill when it happened. We had snow throughout the week, fairly low snow levels for our area. Uh, the Chinook Pass is 5,400 feet, which is around 62, 63. And uh, <coughs> we've been, yeah, been snowing all week. We've been staying on top of the, of the snow as far as ski triggers. It was fairly easy uh, ski cutting throughout the week. Stuff like that. Just as the day warmed up, even even with the cooler temperatures, enough solar was coming in to allow uh, ski cutting on that on that dead surface. Just a thin sun crust, you know, nothing that nothing the major there. You can see where like, my skis are breaking through. Uh, final day of the week, <clears throat> the forecast is for moderate snow throughout the throughout the day. You now with our maintenance crew that morning, so you guys can work for a couple hours, but then we're going to out of there, you know, it snowed again the night before, and uh, we arrived on, on scene, they were working up the road, it was snowing hard at that point. Snow stopped, and within about a 15 minute period, we went from snowfall to clear skies to uh, this dozer operator, you can see the little parts cap, calling on the radio saying, I'm in an avalanche, I'm getting hit by an avalanche, I'm buried, and uh, it, was, you know, it was a pretty weird Situation, you look down the road, see this avalanche is pounding on some of the and he's talking to us on the radio at the same time. <clears throat> but you know, he's a pretty cool cat, and uh, he handled it all right. He's like 35 year veteran of this project, so you know, he's seen a lot. Of, uh, we quickly went into rescue mode. What are we going to do? We charge in, you know, sit back, just had a natural, it's a totally different situation than ski trigger. Uh, you know, we're up against, really up against nature's program at this point. <clears throat> so that's about where he was. We've got this whole area of terrain in there. Um, basically, all that terrain would, would affect our access to the dozer. 
coming in for kind of this side of the east. And once we uh, once we ruled out this area, we still had all of this terrain feeding in. All feeds into about a 50 foot wide area where, where the dozer was. So um, lots and lots of terrain and getting in there to dig, which really wouldn't take more than a few minutes to shovel out the door. Yeah, um, put yourself a lot of risk just standing here, and especially with that uh, that retaining wall. Even the smallest nuts, you know, knocking up your feet put you in a pretty bad situation. <clears throat> so, next approach was to control the avalanche problem of him. Uh, myself and another one of my coworkers went up, and uh, this is our descent route. We figured that there was already natural activity that are set up, which gets the, the first sun of the morning when it slid. Um, it looks up like this, it hadn't slid yet. We, we had been doing control on that slope, so not really a bigger instability, but just that, that new snow. And uh, as soon as I started to poke out onto the slope, this section released, came down. It wasn't moving that fast, but it was definitely like, I don't want to get hit by a slide like that. Crush me on my, my seat. So we made a different approach, which was, this is a different day, this is a, what's that day? Uh, unfortunately, I didn't take any pictures, you know, it's kind of a stressful situation. Uh, but we, we made our, our set up this ridge, which provided us with very little snow above us, rather steep ascent, but, uh, but it was all hiking, so it was a little bit slower than, than we anticipated. And when we reached the top of the ridge here, the first thing I did was I called Tom, who was in the Dozer. He said, Tom, you ready for a slide? He's like, yeah, I've been hit by about six or seven. The last hour of you guys are hiking up there. Okay. <clears throat> Made a snowball, tossed that out on the slope, and yeah, easy size two over, just with a snowball. And, uh, so it was really, really touchy snow at that point. <clears throat> no plan to use explosives, because we, we wouldn't be able to you know, have absolute control over explosives. You threw a hand charge out there and it triggered a slide. You know, who knows where that hand charge is going. Where it's going to detonate. You don't want to detonate on the right? So it was all ski cutting and, and snowballs too. Um, <laughs> this is what the slope looked like, like very few photos I took that day. Um, we estimate that this piece here, a little snowball came out of here, up at kind of cornice. That's what started the, the initial slide that came And uh, it was all just these point releases. Each one of them feeding the snow over. <clears throat> Where he was in the track, he wasn't accumulating any, all those slides that went by didn't accumulate any snow on his dozer, they just all ran over the dozer and continued down into the valley. He had one little wing window that was exposed the entire time, so he had that open air, um, his lunch, thermos, pack of cigarettes. <laughs> uh, yeah, a lot of ski cuttings. Probably took us. I mean, an hour and a half to two hours to completely ski cut every square inch of that terrain. And we really wanted to get it down to nothing. Because then, once we got to the dozer, we have to expose ourselves to any little bit of snow to shovel. Um, <clears throat> just another view of that terrain all feeding into this. This is where the dozer was right there. There's the dozer. We got him out of there that afternoon. And, uh, <clears throat> which presented the next big challenge for us was getting him, and the dozer was up the road that wasn't buried, he was in between two paths, getting these guys across a steep pile of debris. Hadn't even thought about the challenge that was going to be. One guy got it, and he was like, I can't walk across this. It's too steep. I'm like, you got it. <laughs> There's no way around you. So we were breaking trail across there. It snowed all weekend. Uh, returned on Monday, and continued snowing by Tuesday. We got some good weather, got a helicopter in there, bombed the crap out of the place. And uh, <clears throat> by the end of the week, we, we were back to stability. The uh, the main part of that slide path, it actually shifted somewhat east and slide just in front of the blade. That gives a little more additional comfort, even though we're pretty confident that we we're going to get any natural activity while we we're there. But the fact that it was slightly in front of us <coughs> just that much, much better. About an hour shoveling, got the, the cabin covered, and uh, there we are, getting ready to talk.
concentrated, go in, smiling. Got in there, got the cat out, took him about two or three minutes of wiggling back and forth, drove out, smashed the pile down, drove down the road, and uh, took his lunch pail out of there and left him in the, in the cat. There's a pack of hot dogs in there, and hot dogs for lunch. <laughs>